row space, column space, and rank of a matrix. In the context of machine learning, if you have a data frame with two variables, feature one and feature two, with some values, each row corresponds to an observation or data point. Each column corresponds to a feature or variable. So basically here you have one, two, three rows, and you have two columns. Please note that these are just indices. We start with index zero. The row space of the matrix is the span of its rows. So since you have one, two, three rows, you might say, hey, you have three rows that span the row space. We're going to see, we're going to check this later and analyze it in more detail. It captures the essential information about the observations in the data set, the row space. Now, suppose you can write the third row as a linear combination of the first two rows. So basically, you can find C1 and C2, then you can write 2 and 3.5 as a vector, as a linear combination of these two vectors. In this case, the data set lies in a lower dimensional subspace because the third row can be expressed as a combination of the first two rows. Well, the context of machine learning, this is important. Why? Because this scenario happens when there is redundancy or linear dependence among variables or features. Identifying such relations can be useful to reduce dimensionality or understanding what's happening between features and which features contributes the most to the data set variability. Okay, with this introduction, let us go over and define important definitions and go over some theorems and examples for you. For an n by n matrix, remember the way that we defined the matrix. It's a rectangular array with some rows and some columns. You can take each row and define a vector. So row vectors of matrix A includes the first row, A sub 1 and 1, A sub 1 and 2, and A sub 1 and n. The second row or the second vector is A sub 2 and 1, A sub 2 and 2, A sub 2 and n. And finally, you can continue this process, write down the last vector or last row as A sub m and 1, A sub m and 2, and A sub m and n. We saw this before, we treat multiplication between matrices and the rows and columns as vectors to find the dot product between them. As you define the row vectors of a matrix, you can define the column vectors of the matrix as well. So you're basically taking the first column and you, you call it the column vector of A, which is A sub one and one, A sub two and one, and A sub M and one. You can take the second column and you call it the column vector of this matrix, which is A sub 1 and 2, A sub 2 and 2, and you're going to stop at A sub M and 2. And you can continue this process. The last column vector is A sub 1 and N, A sub 2 and N, A sub M and N. Okay, why this is important for us? Because we can take this and define the row space and column space of a matrix. Well, Suppose A is an M by N matrix. The row space of A is the subspace of N space spanned by the row vectors of A. The column space of A is the subspace of M space spanned by the column vectors of A. Now, remember, Elementary row operations, interchanging two rows, multiply a row by a non-zero constant, and add a multiple on the row to another row. If an M by N matrix A is row equivalent to an M by N matrix B, then basically you can say that, hey, the row space of matrix A, the first matrix, is equivalent to the row space of the second matrix. This is the process that we're going to follow. Take a look at this theorem basis for the row space of a matrix. If matrix A is row equivalent to matrix B in row echelon form, then the non-zero row vectors of B, so again, make sure you have this 
non-zero row vectors of matrix B form a basis for the row space of the very first matrix, matrix A. Here we go. Find the basis for the row space. Let us begin by two by two matrix for you. This matrix has first row one, zero, zero, two. Well, we're gonna apply what we learned before in elementary row operations and write this in row reduced form. So here you have the pivot one. We're happy with it. Everything below one is zero. It's good. On the second row, however, you have a two. It needs to be one. So what you can do, you can basically multiply the second row by a half. And then it becomes zero and one. So on the second row, you have pivot one. So you basically created identity matrix. Now that you have the identity matrix, we can talk about the basis for the row space. The row space has basis one and zero, which is your very first row, non-zero row. And the second one is vector zero and one. That's how you find the basis for the row space. Another example for you, a simple row matrix zero, one and negative two. I'm gonna write it in row reduced form. Okay, this matrix is already written in row reduced form. The pivot here is one. We don't have anything below or above one to be worried about. A basis for this row space is a set including this row, zero, one, negative two. Next example, you have a three by three matrix, everybody. You're going to apply what we learned before, elementary row operations to reduce this guy. The pivot is two, which should be one. So what you can do, we can multiply the first row by a half or divide the first row by two. You end up with one, through negative three halves and a half. Everything below one must be zero. So first deal with five. You can multiply the first row by negative five and add it to the second row. It becomes one, negative three halves, a half, and the second row is zero, 10 plus 15 over two, six minus five over two, then you can deal with the third row. You can multiply the first row by negative eight and add it to the last row. And eventually reducing this matrix gives you a new matrix with two non-zero rows and one zero row. Based on the theorem, we are only interested in non-zero rows because the matrix is row reduced to one, zero, four over five, zero, one, one over five, and zero, zero, zero. The basis for this row space is the very first non-zero row, one, zero, four over five. And the second one is zero, one, one over five. And that's it. You're gonna list non-zero rows. You're gonna forget about the zero rows. Next example. Now you have a larger matrix. The pivot is one, and everything below one must be equal to zero. Okay, we have a zero here. You have negative three, then you have a three, then you have a two. What you can do, you can basically multiply the first row by three and add it to the second row, or you could just at the beginning add these two rows together to make this guy equal to zero or make this guy equal to zero. The order is not important, everyone. But applying elementary row operations gives you 1, 3, 1, 3, 0, 1, 1, 0. And then you have 0, 0, 0, 1. And you end up with two zero rows, everyone. Remember that we are not interested in zero rows. We are only interested in non-zero rows. So let us call them W1, W2, and W3. The basis for the row space includes these three matrices, W1, W2, and W3. 
it forms a basis for the rule space of the original matrix that you are interested in 